Bill, in really trying to discern, is there a God, how do we begin to approach the question of, uh, of explanation? Because God is an explanation for stuff. In science, where I was trained, you were trained, generally we think about chance and necessity is something absolutely could only be one way, some laws of physics or mathematics, or are the laws of probabilistics and chance at work and things will work out because of a system. You've talked about, and others too, of course, about design as being a third method of explanation. How can we begin to understand that? Yeah. Well, I think the, perhaps the thing to do is look back a little bit at the history of science because just even the nature of scientific explanations are historically contingent. I mean, it's not that they're written in stone. Aristotle had a science. Stoic philosophy had a science. And I think when we come to the rise of modern science with people like Newton, I think you have a sense that the world operates by deterministic principles. So, if you will, necessity. Things happen. You have a ball in a gravitational field. You release it. It's going to fall down. This happens reliably over and over again. Interestingly, when Laplace tinkers with Newton in the late 17, early 1800s and then writes his essay on probabilities, uh, he talks about a, a purely deterministic world. The thing is, probabilities for him were just a sign of ignorance on our part. We couldn't determine the exact locations, momenta, positions of particles, so we couldn't do Newton's mechanics with perfect accuracy. You just that's, don't why know. We, that's why we needed probability. Now, I think what, what's happened with the rise of quantum mechanics, statistical mechanics, uh, perhaps a little bit with chaos theory, but mainly quantum mechanics, uh, you have a sense that there's an irreducible randomness. I mean, if I flip a coin, you might say, well, I don't know if it's going to land heads or tails, but if I could figure out just what the exact impulse is in your thumb <laughs> and with the coin, then I could figure it out. But there's a sense that when you go to the quantum level, look inside the atom and see the various, uh, how things change various states, electrons, maybe move from one energy state to another, then you get the sense that this happens by some sort of irreducible randomness. At least this is what our si best science is telling right, us. Now, whether right. there's still some deeper level of causation, we don't know, but it's, uh, that's at least, so it seems that we're, uh, science these days is minimally committed to chance and necessity. And those are not, uh, this, uh, they work together. I mean, you, it's not that they're, it's one right. or the other necessarily. Uh, uh, an image that I have of them working together is uh, an agitator where you try to sort stones. You know, if you sort the stones, if you shake, shake it, uh, a barrel with stones in it, uh, there's a gravitational field, there's the effect of necessity, but then there's also this random shaking. And you'll find that there'll be a pattern that emerges. It's a reliable pattern. The, the large rocks will be at the top, small ones at the bottom. You can see this also with the Cheerios box, you know, <laughs> with, with how cereal settles. You know. so, uh, so this sort of interaction between chance and necessity, uh, I think for a lot of contemporary science, that's those are the only explanatory tools we need. And in fact, I'd put it to you that uh, Darwin's theory basically is a chance and necessity theory. It's basically a trial and error sort of approach where necessity is given by natural selection and then uh, the, the chance is the, the random variation. And the, the neo-Darwinian theory, the main theory of evolution these days, is that these are random or chance uh, errors in, uh, in, in the DNA. DNA. So, uh, and, and that that's sufficient to drive everything. Well. If you're going to say that's, that can account for everything, uh, you, know, you, you will want to see some sort of justification for it. Does it really do the job? Does it do the explanatory work? Or do we need to enrich our range of explanatory uh, options? And uh, it seems that evolutionary theory is really the test case. I mean, somebody like Richard Dawkins will say Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. I mean, the implication there is that this sort of chance and necessity mechanism that Darwin proposed can do all the explanatory work. Well, does it really? And how could we test that? And so a lot of my work is focused on trying to come up with, uh, uh, look, look at, if you will, indicia or markers of intelligence that would be beyond the reach of these sorts of chance and necessity uh, approaches. If you will, chance and necessity is a resource for driving evolutionary process. Is it an adequate resource? Now we have this, uh, evolution is a theory of process where you can get from point A to point B. Is, are these purely material mechanisms that depend on chance and necessity, are they adequate to drive it? Uh, and we ask these sorts of questions in a lot of different contexts. If you're at the base of Mount, uh, the, the Mount, Mount Everest and you want to get to the top, 
what sorts of resources will get you there? Will a Chevy Nova get you there? Well, that's not going to be an adequate resource. You know, there are others that might be. And so the sort of question we're asking is, well, what's within the reach of the chance and necessity? What's beyond the reach? And is intelligence something that you need to make sense out of the sorts of patterns that we're seeing in nature and in biology. So, so let's, let's define now the, uh, the landscape that, that you were working in because you can look at design as this so-called third method of, of explanation as it applies to the entire universe, the universe as a whole, mm -hmm. or a, as you've done more so, it, certain elements within the universe. How do you distinguish between those two? Because many of the cosmologists I would talk to, or even the theists who, would, who have scientific background, would be looking more at the universe as a whole, right. as opposed to elements within the universe. Yeah. I find it actually much more tractable as a, as a conceptual problem to look at design within the universe rather than design of the universe as a whole because the sorts of arguments I'm making are probabilistic. I mean, if something can be achieved, if it's within the reach of chance or chance and necessity, there's no need to invoke design. I mean, design, in a sense, becomes an explanation of last resort. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're not going to invoke it if, if you don't have to. Uh, but the thing is, at the level of cosmology, how do you s assign probabilities to you know, the laws of nature taking the form they do. I mean, I've seen everything, you know, from they, they have probability one. Quentin Smith will say the laws of nature are necessary. You know, and others will say, well, it's highly contingent and there's this fine tuning and that suggests that it's highly improbable that this could have happened by chance. You know, so, so there's a whole range of things. And I think the problem is that there's, you don't, there's no mechanism. I mean, if you don't have a universe, how do you have a mechanism or something where you can assign probabilities? I mean, probabilities are assigned, it's always a null hypothesis. In the absence of design, what would the probabilities be? And then, as it were, you defeat that null hypothesis. Uh, and you're saying when you're dealing with the whole universe, you, you, you have no background yeah. in which to establish no, that. No pre-universe yeah, right. you know, that, uh, that, that you can work with. Right. I mean, so, so then you focused your work on recognizing there may be an issue with the whole universe, but, but your work is really unable to handle that because you, you don't... Maybe, when you, when you say unable, I mean, there are people who've applied my methods there, but they have to make certain assumptions, and I think they're, they're questionable assumptions. Uh, but I think when you're dealing in biology, I mean, th these are empirical probabilities. I mean, what is the probability that one DNA will be associated? Are there bonding affinities? You know, how, what, are there, what are the degrees of freedom by which you can rearrange uh, DNA sequences. You know, th those probabilities are, are, are pretty well established. I mean, you can, you can work with those. You can, you can do experiments. You can yeah, do now, there are a lot, of, a lot of discussion, a lot of argument that one could give about those, about different ways to achieve that. But I, I'm trying to get the overview of where, where we are. So we, we're looking at specific things within the universe. We start out with a chance necessity. We add design. We're looking at two different kinds of design, the entire universe or things within the universe. Now we're focused on the universe. Now, what then is intelligent design? What is the program that you've developed, and, and, and how does that um, work in terms of searching for this potential design? Right. Well, uh, if, if I had to give you a simple definition of intelligent design, it would be the study of patterns in nature that are best explained as the product of intelligence. So we're looking at certain features, patterns that we discover in nature, and we ask, is intelligence a better explanation for them than chance and necessity? Now, there, there can be patterns for which chance and necessity is just fine. I mean, that the, the pattern of rocks in this agitator, you know, the wave patterns on a, on a seashore. I mean, there, there are lots of patterns, a lot of self-organizational uh, scenarios uh, where uh, things organize themselves and you get certain patterns. And those are explained apart from intelligent design, but it's, it's looking for what are the types of patterns where we would require intelligence. Now, the thing is, you can tell very, give various thought experiments, which would make it clear that nature could present us with uh, certain things that could not be attributed to anything other than design. I mean, if, if for instance, we go into our DNA and we, we take the DNA and code it as ASCII code, and every, <laughs> every, every sequence ha has a, a limerick there, yeah. you know, and, it, and we say, oh, this is neat. Every, every time we look in DNA for a different person, there's, there's a different limerick there. Yeah. You'd say, well, there's, this, there's something funny going on there. There's design. You know, or if you know, I flipped a coin and I found that uh, 
you know, I get the cure for cancer when I encode this as <laughs> ASCII. You know, this would be a magical penny. So, I mean, there are things that nature could do which, which would convince us that there was an intelligence operating. Even if we didn't have any idea of the causal story, uh, that would, could account for that. We'd still know from the effects that we're now, getting. Now, none of those obvious things uh, have occurred. Uh, no. But, uh, you know, it seems that uh, the less flamboyant things have, and I would say that there are, there are structures in, in bi bi various forms of biological complexity which do suggest uh, that we're, we're dealing with intelligence. And, and that's, that's where the battle is joined, in essence. Yeah. I mean, that's the, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's highly contentious. Yeah.